Good evening. If you'll forgive me, we all know perfectly well that Premier van der Zam is more afraid of promiscuity than he is of the killer disease AIDS. And we all know his answer to sexually transmitted diseases is abstinence, no sex, and we know that he believes that sex education leads to promiscuity. Well, where is he now? He's in Holland <laughs> making a movie. And it causes me to ask, who is running British Columbia, if anybody at all? Some reporter goes up to him and asks him what he thinks of the red light district in Amsterdam. And because the reporter's there, Bill can't resist saying, you know, a red light district might be the answer to Vancouver's problem of hookers. Well, forgive me if I put it in plain English. The prostitution business in Amsterdam is a festering ghetto, one of the eyesores of Europe with 2,000 prostitutes inside peddling their wares, and five or 600 amateurs, druggy amateurs, knocking on the door from the outside to get in. You know, I wish Bill would mend his manners a little bit and not make these ad-lib reactions and suggestions, or we'll all begin to say that not only does he live in fantasy gardens, but that his mind is in fantasy land. Having got that off my chest tonight, here's Ted with a rundown. How does your pension income affect your eligibility for UIC? Tonight, Webster looks at the new UIC guidelines regarding pensions. If you're out of work and can boil water, there are jobs to be found in the restaurant trade. Tonight, Webster goes into the kitchen of the biggest chef school in the city to see what's cooking. But first, does Canada's cultural sovereignty depend on the CBC and two proposed all-Canadian channels? We'll find out. Gerald Kaplan, co-author of the Kaplan Sauvageau Report on broadcast policy, is up first with Webster. The Kaplan Sauvageau Report has been kicking around for some time now, and the other day Flora MacDonald endorsed the recommendations for two new TV networks in English and in French. Now, Gerald Kaplan, one of the co-authors, is here just now. You were not very kind to the Canadian broadcasting industry in your intensive report, were you? Well, yes and no. We said that it's done a lot of wonderful things, but it has a lot more wonderful things that it can afford to do, Jack. Just summarize for me how you would really restructure the whole thing. I know about your All News Channel. Who would have that? All News Channel? Everybody who has cable. All news on cable. All news on cable. And then two other channels, one in French and one in English. What also, would that be for? What would that be for? When we were in Vancouver and everywhere else in the country, we heard the kind of people that Jack Webster loves to stand up for tell us that they feel totally cut out of the broadcasting system. They consider that the CBC should be renamed the TBC, the Toronto Broadcasting Corporation. True, in uh, uh, Indeed, indeed. And people who, were, who were cared about British Columbia, who cared about Western Canada, people who cared about their kids' education, people who cared about minorities felt completely cut out, Jack. The private sector will never have quite enough money to do that. The CBC doesn't have enough time to do that. It's got to be up to a new network. This, of course, is a pie-in-the-sky report because the country's broke. If you listen to Michael Wilson, is that not that correct? That's absolutely wrong. It's a realistic, sensible report in which, with a relatively small expenditure of money, a whole lot of changes could happen. It's a very thoughtful report, Jack. As a matter of fact, you would raise money by taxing the cable subscribers for what? I, I would, we would have each of us ask a little more to our monthly cable bill for the two new networks you talked about. You know it could be done for a buck a month? It's not a lot of money. Even you can afford that. You come from Ontario where there is prosperity, don't no. forget. We come from British Columbia where there is anything but prosperity these days. And then you put a tax on VCRs for something else. The, the, the money that's going to be spent on this would not be spent on making poor people less poor. If it would, I would be the first to endorse it. That's not the issue. Let's get the cover of cultural sovereignty, about which there is stunning ignorance, Mr. Mulroney tells me, in the United States. When I look at your plan, you're going to have an all-news channel, you have all-Canadian channels in French and English, you want all foreign programming removed from the CBC in due course. Right. 95% Canadian. In due course, right. You want to increase the... Canadian stuff in prime time on the CTV network, don't you? Exactly. Who's going to watch all this Canadian stuff? Most of us will just switch on pay TV. Not true, not true, not true. Pay TV is not doing very well. 
Uh, if that's what Canadians wanted, they have their choice of it. Look, if every one of our recommendations were implemented, you and everybody watching would still have every American program you want to watch. It would be available all night. It would be available on the private sector and on the American channels. And you'd have your choice of more Canadian shows. And if you didn't want to watch it, it's your right, but at least you'd have the choice. Don't you think Canadians should have a choice? Well, I don't know. Maybe you can overdo it. We've got lots of choices right now. No. The Knowledge Network, one of the great broadcasting networks in the West Coast. It's, it's very good and it's educational stuff. But look, don't you want the, the soul of Canada? Flora MacDonald said that the drama, that the, the soul, the spirit of Canada has to be reflected in its drama and its situation uh, shows. We don't have very much of that. None of it's on the private sector, hardly. Well, let's go to the CBC first. They haven't done very well either on it, have they? Except for the odd thing like the Campbells. Uh, I'm sorry, the Campbells of CTV. They're, they're, they're <laughs> uh, now I feel badly because I, I don't want to make, make you look as if you no, don't know. No, no, no. It just seemed like a CBC type <laughs> program to me. <laughs> That's what CTV thinks of it too. Uh, millions of Canadians watch those programs. And if you don't want to watch it, you don't have to. But, but how can you not have the right? How can you not have the choice to watch that? It doesn't cost that much money. It costs some money. Mm -hmm. It costs money to be a Canadian, Jack. Mm -hmm. It costs money for, for the railways, mm -hmm. and it costs money for the telegraph, and it costs money for the broadcasting system, and it's a, it's a worthwhile investment. Even the, the, the Minister of Communications agrees with us. Now, you were pretty tough on the CTV network. You said, as a matter of fact, that the CRTC coddled the Canadian broadcasters, treating the airwaves, airwaves as if they were a private property, and that private TV companies have a license to print money. You don't really mean that, do you? Your own, em your old employer, Lord Thompson, was the one who coined the phrase about television broadcasting. Well, that was Scottish elected. television he was talking about. <laughs> what about Canadian well, television? Well, they milk it good here, too. Um, How good? Uh-oh, their profits, even during the recession, were among the highest of any of the private sector in, in Canada. So it's a very lucrative industry. And we say, all of us unanimously, not just me and my, my co-chair, that they can continue to make great profits, but they've got to give something back more to the public. That's not so much to ask. What have you laid down specifically that they've got to give back? They've got to have more quality Canadian programming in peak time. You watch, you watch this network tonight, and my guess is you'll find that most of it is just carrying American shows. And if we want to just have American entertainment, then let's say that's all we want. But, but that's not enough for Canadians. I don't believe it's enough for British you, Columbia. You yourself will want to increase the Canadian stuff in prime time right now, do you not? You mm -hmm. want from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. to right. be 45%. That's right. At the moment, it goes 6 to midnight for 50%. That's right, and it's easy to and do. And do you want that filled every night of the week with Canadian content? No, on average. I want an average over the course of six months to be 45%. Why is it so bad to want equal time for Canada? Not such a, uh, such a That's terrible... That's if you yeah. can produce it, as a matter oh, of fact. Do we, we have the people and the facilities to produce it? You have people walking around Vancouver with such creative talent and with so little resources and with so few areas to put their programs that it's a scandal. And, and that's something these new, er, th these new uh, recommendations would Do you mean. know the amount of money we put out in CFDC and all these subsidized productions? They never seem to amount to a hill of beans, do they? Well, I'm not sure that's right. The private sector is subsidized to a very great extent by the state in a way that most people haven't understood, Jack. A mm hundred -hmm. million dollars worth of, worth of assistance from the CRTC, from the government of Canada, in return for what? In return for giving something back to the public. And that's not American shows. You can get American shows direct on the American networks. Mm -hmm. You would not under this, mind you, this is still, when will this be implemented, if ever? Uh, it's up to uh, the, the minister, that's up to the government, that's up to the CRTC. Um, if ever, I think some of it will be implemented. We got a great deal of support from some surprising places. The minister herself, representatives of the private broadcasters, uh, Mr. Peters, who is uh, one of the owners of this network, uh, said very flattering and warm things at a conference we were at, at together about our report. He can't be wrong. The thing that CTV and the CBC does well, and which Canadians swallow completely, is the news. And uh, news and current affairs is one of the uh, things Canadians have a genius for, and we never seem to get enough of it. Look at you. Oh, I'm an anachronism. Yeah, I was going to say that. Now, the CRTC, you were quite hard on the CRTC. You said they weren't nearly tough enough. What were their faults in your report? The CRTC has allowed people to come before them, made promises, 
gotten the license, made a lot of money, and then not exactly stayed true to the promises they made. And for reasons that we never did understand, the CRDC has let them get away with what some consider murder, we consider too much. You would have left a license no. if they did not? No, they, no. No, 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 but surely one of your complaints too was that the CRTC didn't allow bidding when licenses came up. Yeah. That's right, but that's a different question. That means when BCTV wants its license renewed, you and I can't go to the hearing and say, we've put together a few million dollars, we want to take a crack at that, that uh, license. We have no right to do that. I should hope not. Well, Come to think well, of it quite I, selfishly. Uh, because of you, but <laughs> I would be terrific. You know. But the, the principle is very important. The principle is that So what you're saying about the CRTC is that they haven't been tough enough for making stations live up to the original of the repeated program promises over the years. That's exactly right. And all, all one says is if you make a promise, you'd better live up to it. That's fair. And you would finish up now with the CBC network controlled out of Toronto, the Eastern Media Mafia. We would, my recommendation, our recommendation was that the new network not be based or headquartered in Toronto, and my own strong view was that it should be based in Western Canada. And it's also a very unbureaucratic network. There is no massive bureaucracy in a great big building with... Uh, it's rich bound people. to be. Look at the CBC with their famous buildings in Ottawa with not, e not even a microphone in them. If, if anybody followed our recommendations, that would not happen to TV Canada. If it happened, don't blame me. TV Canada would be on cable? TV Canada would be on cable. One of the problems that people so are worried have to, about... You must, everybody must have a converter, of course, before they can see anything. Uh, it's an important point, and I want to raise it. Our calculation, our research suggests that by sometime in the next five or six or seven years, 90% of people with cable will have either built-in converters or their little hand converter, and so the problem of knocking those uh, popular American shows off is not the issue. We shall now hold our own small mini task force on general Kaplan's view, views after the break. <laughs> You may decide my fate. Why should I be nice to him? Exactly. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Jack, Mr. Kaplan. Sir. I don't think any price would be too small to pay uh, as a surcharge on my cable bill to spare me the mind-numbing rubbish such as this latest program, America, which CTV will be carrying, the LBJ life story. What relevance that has to me as a Canadian is just beyond me. I think a dollar is, is a small price to pay for some decent programming. And the only place we're getting it right now in this country is from the CBC. More power to you. Thank you, sir. How do you like that? I heard somebody say that they wanted to run a program called Burnaby Vice out of his studio. Is there any truth for that? Huh? Could be if I you knew what was on in Burnaby. <laughs> I heard it. Go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Kaplan, I agree with you completely. And as soon as I heard about your report, I agreed with it totally. I mean, anybody that would be opposed to it, I think, is not a, can't call themselves a Canadian at all. And I just wish that, I just hope, I hope and pray that it does get on. Thank you, sir. Luck in the world. Thank you. Why don't you write your member of parliament and to the minister a serious suggestion I make? Maybe I will. To, to I say that you're idea. behind her. Good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I hit him a wee bit soon. Go ahead from Penticton. Yeah, I, I'd just like to make a comment, gentlemen, that uh, nine out of ten of your CB of your uh, programs that we see on our uh, cable up here in Penticton, the language is so coarse and ugly that we can't even watch it ourselves, let alone let our children or or any of our younger members uh, watch it. Uh, this is not an issue for me. This is an issue for people involved in newsmaking, and I don't know what you would think of it. Uh, the story. You're not talking about newsmaking. Oh, you. No, you're I'm talking about movies, probably. Uh, well, the the, the 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 latest Mulroney scandal about this man Walter Wolf. There is a word being used that Wolf quotes somebody using that begins with an S, and a number of news stations carried it because it was a news uh, issue. So that's that's a nice question. I don't think. That's not what he's talking about. What's, What's your complaint, like sir? movies. Where are, where are you? He's gone. He's gone. No, he wasn't talking about that. Oh, because I've heard people complain about the dirty language, the language. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I'd like to, to give uh, all the power in the world to this gentleman, because if we can get more Canadian production, because I agree with him, there's all kinds of talent in this city that just needs a vehicle to, to get these things created. And, uh, yeah, and I agree with that the former caller about all these programs about America and all that crap. We, you know, we've got some stuff here of our own that we can produce that would... Fair enough, it's fair more enough. worth watching than that stuff. Right. I don't know anybody who watches Dynasty of Dallas, of course. Uh, All the soap operas. Apparently not your viewers. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I'd just like to say that I think one of the big reasons that the quality of Canadian television isn't that great all the time is that a lot of the programming doesn't have that as a priority. 
I mean, really, why would the Americans come up here and film all their shows if we didn't have the talent? I think the talent's here, it's just it's not being given the opportunity to prove itself. Good for you, sir. If we spent nearly as much money on, on a Canadian show as the Americans spend on theirs, not as much, even nearly as much, we'd have a lot more shows that people would not protest about. Good for you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I would like to know why that we have some person that is going to tell us what we have to watch. We are Canadians, and believe you me, we are passive. And we've got, why can't we look at the TV that we want to look at? Why is if we don't want to watch American TV, we can watch Canadian? And if we don't want to watch Canadian, we can watch European. We have so many people telling us what we have to watch that we should be able to watch what we want. Everybody says, like, you want to get uh, pay TV, then you can afford it. You know, it's $19 and some odd ruddy cents that a lot of people can't afford. Yeah, just a minute, you get his point? Yes, the, I think he fears that we want to force people to watch Canadian programs, and I want to repeat, it's absolutely untrue. No one will lose their right to watch whatever they want. Everyone will have all the American programs they want. They just have a larger choice under our scheme, and that still seems to me... Providing they're on cable and they've got a converter. Providing they're on cable, and most Canadians are. I'm sorry I missed the caller's remark. Yeah, he said provide... Are you, are you on cable? Yes, I am. Well, you've got a fair selection at the moment, even if you... If your favorite American channels were moved up the dial, the reception is all good now, isn't it? Yeah, but that's not the point, Jack. It's a point that we're so already passive in this country that we should be able to watch anything we want to. Well, you can. No, you can't, because you've Why? got this man here telling us that we have to want Canadian television. Majority of, of Canadian talent is good. No, all he's saying is that he wants a couple of new channels, all news, on cable, French and English, for which you would pay on your cable charge or buying the VCRs with tax advantages for domestic production. You want to ex increase the, the presentation. Exactly. You're the spokesperson for our report. Well, it saves a lot of time sometimes. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Kaplan why so many of the good Canadian actors and actresses go to the States to work instead of staying in Canada and working in the garbage that the Canadian production people put up. He's talking about made for movie Canadian films. Well, made I, for TV Canadian I films. I assume serious creative people right. don't like to do garbage. And of course they go south because the money's bigger, the market's bigger, the fame is greater. But I, I, I do believe that our, if, if some of our recommendations were introduced, there'd be a lot more reasonable and useful jobs for creative Canadian talent. Providing it doesn't become a Canada Council gimmick, a National there's, Film there's Board no gimmick. There's no reason for that, for, for that to an, become uh, that. Or a scientific tax research credit gimmick. Ah, We're ah, also mistrustful of public money being spent in funny ways. But the private broadcasters don't mistrust the public money. They get it in a million ways. They get it from the broadcast fund. They get it from Bill C-58. And yet the criticism is only made of the money that's used for Canadian programs. So I think we should get our balance straight. The broadcast fund. The Broadcast Fund is another government fund to help as an incentive to create Canadian programs. But private broadcasters are entitled to use it. So it's yet another source of government funds to the private sector. But you say they make lots of money. Why should they have that Broadcast Fund? As an incentive to do a Canadian program. It's a good question. Go ahead, please, from Victoria. Yes, I'd uh, just like to mention, you know, for the amount of money that we spent to have you people travel the countryside to get this information that you're going to force on us, and you tell us that the Canadian taxpayer just pay another dollar and we can have this and have that, yeah, yeah, yeah. wouldn't it be better if uh, you all just sent through the government mail service uh, like a, a questionnaire saying what would you like to watch and what you wouldn't like to watch, mark it down, count them up there, and then you'd find out what the majority of the people want, not just what the few minority people have that go to these demonstrations and meetings and tell you what you are, and you say, this is what everybody wants. How about that? I don't think so. I don't think it would be just as good. Uh, we're going to have a forum tonight, and I predict there'll be several hundred people who care oh, yes. enough about the issue yeah, to come out. There's 700 people. You're not going to talk for several thousand people around Vancouver that you can only fit in a small hall. Uh, there it is tonight, half past seven on Robson Square Media Center. He get, gets a couple of hundred thousand people on here. That's right. Which is a bigger hall than the Robson That's Media right. Center. If you get them all to form once, you'd probably find a good majority of people just like it the way it is and don't want these things pushed against us. And then you're going to push oh, the American Channel but, off, and i got to pay a buck to watch that. And then you're going to give me something that, <laughs> uh, in some cases, or in majority cases, the 
acting is not as good in a lot of cases because the good ones have gone south for the winter. Canada doesn't exist on the basis of the votes or, or polls or surveys of a majority or minority of people. It exists in, in spite of our geography, in spite of our numbers, and it takes an awful lot of public policy decisions to do it. And that, if, if, if it weren't for that, we wouldn't have a country. We'd just be part of the United States. Well. Anyway, thanks very much. Go ahead, please. You know, I'm totally opposed to having all this Canadian content crammed down our throat. It has to make it on its own, on its merit, Jack, and it just doesn't. I find it inferior. Perhaps it's uh, the, a victim of the principle you're not a prophet in your own land. I like the Australian uh, movies and shows. Maybe we should send ours down there. But it definitely has to make it on its merit, and I, I think in an objective analysis, it just doesn't. Here's a, uh, a network that gives us the Fifth Estate and the Suzuki program and Man Alive and uh, the Journal and CTV gives us its news and, uh, and programs like your own and you have Anne of Green Gables and you have the Charlie Grant's War and then you have viewers say that uh, Canadian content is junk and that we don't see anything good on uh, Canadian television. So I'm confused sometimes by what uh, some of some Canadians want. He's telling you off, Carla. No, what, what? What is all this emphasis on Canadian? Anyhow, I think of myself as a citizen of the earth. You know, we don't need these damn borders, do we? Uh, mm. uh, uh, That's something for, else again. I pray for them to disappear, but uh, it's I mean, not going to happen for a while. Thing. I, um, it just makes he just doesn't like the idea of anything being stuffed down his throat, a taxpayer's money being used. Superior. Okay, Gerald Kaplan, Bright Broadcast. You've done some broadcasting in your own right from time to time, from as time I to recall. Time, I appear on this very uh, station early Thursday mornings on the Canada AM program. Uh, in fact, yes, I enjoy it. It's fun. And I see we've lost another good gal to the States, Linda McClellan. Yes, she's gone from CTV to take over. In fact, a very every good major job, newscast in the United States seemed to come from Canada nowadays, all the networks. Well, uh, it's the Big Apple. Uh, that part is never going to change. Uh, ultimate success for some people, but uh, guys like you and me, we hang in, Jack. Old timers like us. Well, <laughs> I suppose so. My thanks, General Kaplan. Thanks to you. Uh, the, we'll the see you on the box, as they say. And I shall be back with the Webster Walkabout after the break. <laughs> There's nothing tougher than trying to find a job in BC these days if you're a young person or a middle-aged person and fairly unskilled. But I might be able to find you a job if you can get into VVI and get the proper training in the food service industry. This really is a hive of activity. And this is Tony Woods. Tony. Um, Good morning, Jack. Of VVI. If I complete your food service courses here, how long will it take me? It'll take you 12 months. You'll do four months uh, for each course. We have three courses. Short order? Short order, in institutional and camp, and a la carte and banquet. What are my chances of getting a job if I'm one of the 400 or so graduates here every year? About 85% at the moment is job placement out of this program. Good. I want to go and talk to some of the people. Okay. Tell me, sir, what are you doing this morning? What's your name? Ryan Sinclair, Mr. Webster. Are you one of the instructors? I am here? indeed. Do you have to throw many people out because they just don't have a touch for food? Well, we don't throw them out. We try and encourage them to learn the uh, correct procedures, give them the incentive. And? And send them on to the industry. Which section am I in now? You're in the a la carte section of the uh, kitchen that does the restaurant in the morning. Good. Thanks very much. I want to speak to some of the people. Hi. Hello. How are you? Fine, thanks. What's your name? Vincent Robles. How old are you? Uh, 26. How long have you got to go to finish your full course? Uh, till May 1st. Can you get a job? I hope so. How much do you hope to get paid? Hopefully, well, I should be starting at 5 or $6 an hour. Good, good. Best of luck. I'm going to walk around here and talk to some more people. Good morning. Good morning. When do, where did you learn to make puff pastry? Here. Here? Yeah. Where are you from in BC? Powell River. How long have you been down on the coast? About eight years. What makes you want to be a chef? Oh, I like doing it. I'm tired of working outside. How long have you got to go till you graduate? Another three months. Have you had a job lately at all before you came here? No, I've just construction and sawmills. And so now you're going to be a chef? Yeah. How much will you get for that, do you think? Oh, I don't know. It doesn't really matter as long as I like doing what I'm doing. Tony, when a guy finishes his courses here, is he, a, he can be a fully qualified chef 
But sometimes he goes on for an apprenticeship. Well, a fully qualified cook, Jack, not a chef. If he wants to go through to be a chef, they will have to take an apprenticeship, which means that he will get credit for the 12 months that he has done here in the college and then spend a further two years in different hotel kitchens throughout the city. Okay. Now, what's going on in here? Stir it. You know, you're going the wrong way. You've got to stir the soup the other way. Did nobody tell you that? You've got to go that way. Now you know. Okay. Do you know that in Australia, the water goes down the drains the other way? Yeah. But here it goes on the top. Now tell me all about yourself. Uh, What's your name? Trina. Trina. You, are you from Vancouver too, Trina? No, Delta. You're from Delta? Yeah. Okay, Trina. Trina. Bye. Are, Bye. are your salad makers good? These look rather impressive. Thank you. Hey. What's the secret to making an attractive salad? Inspiration. <laughs> I'm not making salads myself, but I like the way you do tomatoes. Now Thank let's you. go over here. Ah, something I've always wanted to learn to do. Would you hold that microphone, please? Certainly, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. Webster. And your name? Bingley. Bingley. And Looks your right. name? Rob Weber. And what's he showing you how to do? Philip. We we'll fillet some flounders today. Fillet some flounders. Right. Can I fillet a flounder? Uh, sure, you can show you. Well, tell me how to do it. Okay. Cut well, down the back. Let's get a fresh one for you to start on. Now, all you're on the flounder is you, you can find a line on both sides of the white skin. I see it. And the dark side, you're going to put your knife on that line okay, and pull it right it down. down. You bet. Right down? Well, only to the vertebrae bone. Just to the vertebrae bone. Is that here? Yeah, straight down. Now I have to dig it off. Now, now you go from the tail. Just mind your hands, don't put yourself. That's the idea. No. Okay. I'm stuck. You're doing fine, that's good. All right. That's one side. I'll let you do the other okay. side. <laughs> Tony, is it difficult? The demand for spaces in this must be phenomenal now in yes. the food service. Yes, it is. It's, it's fast becoming uh, British Columbia's number one industry. And it's difficult to get money to come here, isn't it? I mean, you can get it if you're on UIC. Yes, uh, and you can come in if you're on UIC, but otherwise our rates are very reasonable. They're $75 a month if you compare that with the cost of going to university. But if you've got no money for living and you're dead, can Thank you do it when you're on welfare? You can do it on welfare. We have people sent in from the uh, health and welfare, and uh, they s send in the students. Okie dokie. Now I'm in the special Chinese cooking section. I know microphone. your face. Yeah, you know me. I have to watch you. Eh? You're from West Vancouver. Yeah. And your name? Harry. You know Harry? Harry you... Market? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Are you the chief instructor here? Yeah, no, no, no. Um, yeah, that one. Are you a student? Yeah, a student, yeah. Good. Hello, what's that? Can. Can. What? what is it? Can. You want to try? Well, how long would it take to make me a Chinese cook, to make me into a cook of Chinese food? It only takes 20 years and three minutes. Why three minutes? Oh, the three minutes to cook 20 years to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Your name? Ah, oh, I'm Felix, Felix Fu. Is it good Chinese food here? Silly oh, food. yeah, yeah. We have the, the authentic Cantonese food. Plus, on Friday, every Friday, we have the dim sum. And also, we also serve the barbecue. Good show. Let's go to the bakery. OK. Aha, uh -huh. what do we have here, ma'am? Yeah, this is the cherry path. Cherry path. And you made them all with your own little hands? Uh, no, somebody else made it, but just we put it in the oven. What's your name? My name is Mackay. Mackay? Yes. I thought it's got accent you've got, though, is it? <laughs> Tell me, uh, Mackay. Yes. Um, are you finished, nearly finished your training as a baker? No, I just I have been for five, ma five months. I still need uh, five, six months more. 
Yeah. You're learning. You like it. Yeah, I like it. Thank you very much, yeah. Makai. What's yeah, your first yeah. name, Makai? Uh, my first name is Makai. My last name is Ato. Makai? Ato. Ato. Yes. We had a little misunderstanding there, but yes. nice to meet you. Now we're off to see the wedding cake. Do you make happy birthday cakes for customers that come into the retail shop? Yes, we do. And the orders are taken, and they pay for them in advance, and they come in and pick them up when they're ready for them. Jolly good show. Well, I want to get round here beside... I understand this is your wedding cake, is it? Is it? <laughs> is it? No, it's not. Are you already married? Yes. Ah, oh, well, I'm sorry about that. What's your name? Aggie. Aggie. Nice to meet you, Aggie. Now, is the wedding cake all ready to go? Oh, yes, it is. If I wanted to order and buy a wedding cake like that, although I have no plans at the moment, what would it cost me? $51. Oh. $51, eh? It would cost me three times that much in a store, wouldn't it? Uh, at least two, for sure. At least two. Yeah. What's your name again? George Rudolph. You're the bakery instructor? Yes, I am. You don't operate 24 hours a day in the bakery, do you? Uh, Right now, about 16. About 16. Yeah. And sell all your stuff outside. Six in the morning till uh, 9.30 at night. Good. Yeah. Well, another job for Webster. I'm going to serve in the big store at VVI. Ma'am, you come here all the time? Uh, quite often, yes. And what do you buy mostly? Mainly bread. Mainly bread. How much is a loaf here? 50 cents. As against what in the store? Oh, a dollar, dollar 19. And you too, ma'am. You're a yes. regular customer. Yes, I am. I come here all the time. Yeah. It's all good. The deli included. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. You're not allowed to eat with you behind here, so I better leave. Here I am in the somewhat classy dining room of VVI. The whole place has been done up since I was last here 20 years ago. Many people can just sit down for meals here. In the dining room itself, 80. And otherwise, you've got... Otherwise, we have the cafeteria, of which we seat 600. And we have, we feed the Chinese cuisine people into the cafeteria. I see. It open from what, 8 in the morning? Yes, we open the cafeteria at 8 in the morning to late at night. How much do you take in in money, food money from people? Over the year, it works out to be about a million and a half dollars. <laughs> a million and a half. A million and a half dollars. That covers the cost of all the food that we do, plus all the higher Now, help. who is this gentleman here? Your name? My name is William Featherston Haw. Okay, let me test your memory, Mr. Featherstone. Oh, what have I ordered? You've ordered the spinach salad and the salmon in the puff pastry. How much? For the spinach salad, it's 95 cents, and the salmon is $4. That's good and cheap, isn't it? Yes, yes it, it is. is. Very reasonable. As a matter of fact, I see a New York steak here is only how much? <laughs> it's uh, $5, sir. $5. Yes, Jolly sir. good show. Okay. Off you go. I don't want to give any false impressions, Tony, but the fact is that in your food service division, yes. what would be the lowest percentage of the chance of getting a job? About 60%, and that'll be from, from this area here at the moment. Good. Now, here's our waiter. Here's your spinach salad. My spinach salad looks beautiful. And the nice. salmon in the puff pastry. And you serve them both at the same time for the sake of our camera's convenience. That's, that's correct, sir. Usually we would serve the, the salad first, followed when you were finished with the salmon. Thank Hope you very you enjoy much. Enjoy your meal, sir. Thank, thank you very you. much. And thank you very much, Tony Wood. Thank of you very BBI. much. Of Thank you for coming down. I here. shall now enjoy my $4.95 lunch. When do you start? Ten o'clock in the morning. Go straight through until six, eh? Yeah, you gotta be. Yeah. You know, I've got to make decisions, you know. <coughs> well done. I'm Robin Sinclair. I'm over doing the MVP this week. Show how it up, Rob Dunn. Good for you, Sven. I replaced Sven on the Board of Governors. Of course, he had leaked everything. Yeah, right after him. What order were you introducing him? I'll introduce the first, and then I'll introduce Marty camera right. van der Weerdo. Camera two, camera three, and then... And then Len Luomo. Luomo? Luomo or Luomo? I mean, forget the U word. Silent movie anyway. Len Luomo. Luomo, yeah. No, I ran Sven's campaigns at UBC for him. So when he left, I took over from there and... Uh, I'm not going to support his campaign to reduce uh, sodomy to a permissive age of 16. I, d I don't know he was pushing that, is yeah, it? Yeah, of course he is. I said, we can talk about it on the air with me. Once God don't send you in charge of his party politics. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> he is an idiot. I know he got in trouble with you one time on, uh, on the very... 
November 1984, a number of retired Canadians, particularly ex-military and RCMP, were very angry when the federal government announced that pension income would be deducted from any unemployment insurance earned. And there's an appeal group in Vancouver Island, and I've got them here tonight to tell you they're now happy with what the government says it's going to do. And I have Mo Sahota, who's the NDP MLA for Esquimalt, right? And uh, I have um, Marty van der Weerd, who's one of the committee, and Len Lomo. Now, when you retired from the military, how old were you? I was 40 years old. 40 years old. And how much of a pension did you get? $126 a week. Now, did, were you ever in a position whereby when you do your UIC, the 126 was deducted? No, not until this new law came into effect. Now, how about you? You retired from the military when? I retired in uh, November 1985 mm -hmm. with 30-year service. And uh, I was looking for another job. I was forcefully retired as Compo uh, Your compulsory. time was up. You had My to time, go. I had to go. And uh, I drew UIC for one week. And then they cut it off for the simple reason I was in receipt of a pension. And deducted it. Now, I want more to explain to me the complications of all of this because I was under the impression that when the minister announced that in December 86 <laughs> that they would let them collect again uh, unemployment insurance without deducting the pension income, I thought your battle had been won. No, that was fluff in December of 80, uh, 86. That was pure fluff when the minister stood up and said that. What happened was on, the Janu on January the 5th, 1986, the government introduced regulations under the UIC Act which said that if you were in receipt of unemployment, uh, sorry, of, of pension income, then you would not be eligible for UIC payments. Right. Okay? Now, there was an outcry when that happened because particularly hard hit were, were military personnel. There was a demonstration on Parliament Hill. We had undertook a, a legal challenge to the regulations. The legislature of Nova Scotia passed a unanimous resolution condemning the regulations. We started to challenge them in, in court. We started to win some cases, and we started to lose some cases. Flora MacDonald, who was a minister at that time, deferred the whole matter to the Forger Commission because the thing was getting just too hot for her, and the Tories were looking for a way out. Forger comes down with a recommendation this year, says get rid of the whole thing, allow those people who are receiving pension income the ability to receive UIC. The government then, on December the 5th, 86 this year, makes the announcement that they're going to do something about it, and the something that they're going to do about it is to say that those who moved on to a second career will be eligible for UIC despite the fact they receive a pension income. Those who are leaving the first career will not be eligible for UIC despite the fact they receive that very same pension income. Right. Now, if I were Marty and came out after 30 years and I'd paid my UIC for 30 years, I would not, even if I got a pension less than the UIC maximum, I would not be allowed to draw UIC, is that correct? Well, no, I wouldn't be able to allow to draw UIC because my pension would uh, be bigger than my UIC benefits. In other words, I wouldn't be able to get any, but I would have paid into it for 30 years. But that's your point, is it not? Okay, and worse than that, not only would the government get 30 years of free money from Mar Marty, but worse than that, as he went on to his next job, he'd still have to pay into UIC knowing all along that he will never be eligible to collect UIC. Now, we've argued that you can't do that, 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 it, that we're dealing with a program of unemployment insurance. And you're eligible to get insurance, of course, when, something, when, a, when a contingency occurs, such as unemployment. Okay, that's how it's an insurance program. What the government is saying to these people, it's a little bit like buying house insurance. Your house burns down, and you're told that you can't get insurance because you're a member of the military. It's See, crazy. I thought that the promise by the government in December 5th, 1986, corrected it, but it didn't. No, it, no. in fact, it, it, it tangled a further web for the government. Listen a minute. If I've done my 30 years in the armed forces and I come out now with this intended move by the government, I can't draw you, I see. That's right. If I go and get a job, Right. And I'm laid off, and I've paid UIC. Can I draw it then? You can draw under these intended regulations. You can draw UIC then, Let's despite the fact that you're receiving that same pension income. See, the people that are really hard hit are the people who retire for the first time from the military. They're age 45. They got a family, they got a house, they got kids, and all that kind of stuff out there. They're in between jobs. They're being told that you can't collect UIC because you're receiving this pension income. But for a guy like Len, who retired in 1980, who receives that same pension income. He's being told that he can collect UIC despite the fact that he collects that income because he's now moved on to a second job. Oh, we how say they that's foul things up. When you retired, you got a pension which is now $126 a week. Yes, it was when I retired too. And did you get a job right away? Yes, I did, yeah. 
and when you were laid off, you got normal UIC. That's right. Until they brought in the change in 84 when they said, we'll deduct it from your UIC, correct? Correct. Yeah. News. And now you tell me, and let me get this right. I'm in the services. I've done my, I've got my golden handshake, although even your golden handshake is only, what, 200 a week after 30 years. That's right. Yeah. And your golden handshake to 126 a week after how many years? 22 and a half. 22 and a half years. I thought you got big fancy pensions. That's what a lot of people think. But Mo, check me on this. If I'm, <laughs> if I retire now after 30 years, even under this, I can't draw you. I see, even That's though correct. I paid into it. They've got 30 years of free money from you. You cannot collect. Unfair. Now, should you be able to? Well, yes, because the whole idea of you paying into UIC, it's an insurance that's designed to cover you when something catastrophic like unemployment happens. And that's the whole idea of insurance. You pay premiums in order to be eligible. What Forget said, look, from these people, either you don't collect premiums or you pay them insurance, one or the other. But you can't have your cake and eat it, too. What the government is doing now is they're collecting both the premiums and deciding not to pay insurance. 4J was 100% right, and it's interesting, it was the only, one of the only unanimous recommendations in his report, and it's the only one that the federal government has moved on in some way uh, since his report came down. And they know the heat is on, they aired on this one, and they're you, looking for a way You out. don't trust, this promise made by the minister in the House on December the 5th is not specific enough, nor does it cover the first career. Well, we say that what the government ought to do is it ought to do exactly what Forge said, rescind the whole thing. Forge said, you've tangled the web for yourself, get yourself uh, reorganized and come back, uh, and come back with a new policy three years from now. So we say to the government, what you're proposing here doesn't make sense. It creates an inequity that uh, yeah. has no rational basis at all. Therefore, rescind the whole thing, take it back to where it always historically was, Honor the deal that you made with the armed forces when you said that you would provide them with uh, with UIC, and then come up with a new policy three years from now. Yeah. Meanwhile, if you if you did retire after armed forces service or RCMP service and had a pension bigger than UIC and you weren't working, you wouldn't expect to draw anyway, would you? Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't quite. <laughs> I know it's difficult. <laughs> if I had a pension, we'll say of fifteen hundred a month, and I come out with the RCMP. Right. I wouldn't want to draw UIC, would I? Well, I don't know if you would or if you wouldn't, but under the old regulations, you were eligible to receive UIC, notwithstanding pension income. And the government recognized that point. Under the old regulations, they had said, for example, the ones that we're upset about here, they had said if, if you're receiving a private pension of $1,500 a month, and, it, and if you, you, you've gone out and purchased an annuity or an RSP that gives you back $1,500 a month, we don't calculate that in. If you rent a house and earn $1,500 a month from that rental, we don't calculate that in for UIC purposes. But aha, uh -huh. if you have that pension from the federal government or from any other employer-employee uh, pension, then we're going to count that in for UIC. That, that was straight discrimination. That was straight inequity, yes. Yeah. That's every working person in the country, too, not mm. just armed forces. I think I've got it. I'm not quite yeah. sure. Let's see if we get some calls on the subject. <coughs> Moussa Hota, Len Loma, and Marty van der Weerd. Van der Weerd! <laughs> Thanks, Dick. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do accept my humble apologies. I'll, tr I'll accept. After the break. <laughs> This, by the way, is the NDP MLA who speaks on the conflict of interest regulations for the NDP in the House. Do you know all the capers we have? Um, go ahead, please. Yes, I just wanted to say that I agree it is pure, unadulterated discrimination, and they shouldn't be allowed to do it. Thank <laughs> you, ma'am. Well, that's clear enough. Go ahead, please. Just like to say that if they're going to preclude a certain uh, occupation from collecting un unemployment insurance, then there's no way they should be collecting from the from them in the first place. That's exactly what Mr. Forge said. Forge said you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't collect the premiums and then deny them insurance. And uh, we agree with you 100%. And we've challenged them in court. And because of the fact that the minister made this announcement in December, <coughs> we put everything uh, on hold from the court end of it uh, for the time being because if new regulations come in, then you know the court case falls. Fair enough, thank you. From Castle Gar. Yeah, how long will you receive UIC? If if you do qualify, is it 50 weeks maximum? That's right. It would That's be right. for the normal benefit. For the one year, not for the rest of your life. Of course, no, sir. Of course not. That's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead from Penticton. Good evening, Jack. Evening. I'd like to speak to the MLA and the question of, they're indicating that it is insurance. They're not indicating. They have called it insurance. That's right. And in fact, any insurance, Jack, when you pay into it, you pay all your life into a fire insurance and you hope your house never burns down. 
That's right. And you cannot then go to the insurance company and say, please give me the money or some of this money I've paid in back. Of course not, ma'am. And we're not saying that. We're saying that you should only be covered in the event of that fire or in this case in the event yes. of unemployment. We're not saying that, you know, let's hope that no one ends up being unemployed. But in the event that you do, then you ought to be covered if you paid in. Just like with your house, if it burns down, you ought to be covered. But we're not saying at the end of the day you should be able to get the money back because, because you were never unemployed. I mean, you're right. That doesn't make sense uh, in sir, terms of insurance. when these people have worked and they've taken their own option to retire from the no. service. Well, a lot no, of these no. people were forced to retire. In How fact, about you, Len? Were you? I was forced out. After 22 and a half years and you yeah. got 126 a week. That's right. That's and right. you were drawing your full on UIC when you could. <laughs> but when new, yeah. new regulations come in, the 126 came off your entitlement. Yeah. If you earned 126 a week, then you actually. Right. Yeah, Most yeah, people think that we're early retirees. We're Why not. Don't you we're justify forced the out. Idea that when these people pay their, pen, their insurance premiums in, within a very, very short time, they have drawn back everything they've paid into it, and there is just no justice to this idea that they should sit and draw for a year, also draw an, an, a good pension, which is in many cases enough to live on. Well, maybe, maybe I should answer the lady on that and give you some statistics here. Uh, as I'm representing about 71,000 retired servicemen, out of the 71,000, there is 31,000 that receive a pension of $4,500 a year, and the other 41,000 receive a pension of an average of 10,000 a year. As you know, that the poverty line in Canada for a couple is 14,000 a year, I will not say that that is a fat cat pension, ma'am. No, I know, but she's making a point. Let me go over that again. I hesitate to go over that. But no, if right. I presently am in the service, and I do my 30 years, right. and I have paid you, I see, do you want me to collect for the year thereafter? No, no. No, just no, no you don't. Right. No, 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 but they as are. long as I'm, no, no, no ma'am. The, the minute I was laid off, the minute I was laid off or forcefully retired, yes. I was genuinely looking for a job, and luckily enough, I found a job within four months. Some company ha is still what willing to hire older workers. With beards. With beards. How and I got, and I got a job. have not and are purposely just drawing a whole year with the idea they paid into it. You used to be able to do that, They too. paid in was very nominal comparison to what well, they are drawing what we're out. Saying, ma'am, what we're saying is anybody who, who's in this situation ought to be treated like everybody else. Everybody else has to fill out a declaration saying, yes, I'm out there looking for work. And if you're out there looking for work, you're entitled to UIC. And we're saying these people ought to be treated just like all of the other people are. The quality of treatment for each of these people. I hate to ask this one. Is it, is it an upper age limit to qualify for UIC? Yes, there is. I, it's 65 now. And there's an interesting court case on, on that one that was uh, resolved before the Supreme Court. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello, Jack. I'd like to say that I, two points. I know a person that was in war and uh, peace uh, service, and he did 27 years. He farmed for a while, and then he had a, 10 years as a provincial employee. Right. And when he was mandatory uh, retirement at 60, he was told that he would get one year unemployment insurance. But after two weeks, he was so harassed about where, where, where are you looking for work and how many jobs have you sought and that. And uh, so he took a job for $8 an hour. So there he goes again, paying into UIC and Canada Pension. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like to say that with uh, the increase in Canada Pension, I am on a long-term disability <coughs> and I got 175 increase dollar increase in January and Great West Life they are allowing me to keep about five dollars. Mama, I have very sympathy for you because they're taking off your other pension, is that right? Well, yes. They, in other words, the 170 extra is coming from Ottawa and uh, so Great West Life is putting that in their pockets. And well, they did sorry. it in January. They, immediately they did it. Sometimes they take a little while to do things, but they Maud, did it do you know anything about that one? The, uh, no, know? not off the top of my head. I look at the have to look at case. It. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed, ma'am. We've only got you represent 71,000 retirees in the military. That's right. Well, one thing you've done is disabuse me of the fact I thought you all got big, fancy, golden handshakes. <laughs> well, obviously no. we didn't. Okay, well, I see you're a great proponent of uh, Van der Zand's gambling, but I haven't got time I'll to talk I'll have a chat about. with you later on on that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> conflict you might of interest. Sue too. me for that. <laughs> uh, my thanks to Mozart Hota and the two retired military men, and I'll be back after the break. Ed Broadbent cancelled the trip over the weekend. 
but he's guaranteed to be here tomorrow as leader of the NDP because I haven't been involved enough in all these Ottawa scandals and at least we'll get the NDP detail on what's wrong with the Mulroney government tomorrow night on Webster at 5 p.m. precisely.